Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 38th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfan Sukunik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube. And I'm Mark J. Maharaj, also known as Question Mark on YouTube. And today, we're speaking with antinatalist and ethelist artist, YouTuber, and the author of the recent mind-blowingly brilliant The ABCs of Antinatalism coloring book, The Ethics of Procreation from A to Z, Life Sucks! So welcome to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Life Sucks. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to have you. Uh, so let's start out with just the most basic of questions. Who is Life Sucks? Well, to quote the human suplex machine, Taz, I'm just another victim. <laughs> um, you know, placed here without my consent. Um, but of course, my parents you know, who put me into this place uh, and then abandoned me. Of course, they didn't probably didn't want to abandon me, but they did. Um, they also, you know, played a big part in who I am because they supplied me with uh, endless amounts of crayons and paper when I was a child. And I was probably one of the few children who had a, has had a drawing desk since I was about three years old. And uh, my mother <clears throat> worked at a computer center and back in those days, um, not everyone had a tablet or you know, there was no home PC or any way to look at the data. So, of course, they just printed things and printed them in great volume, you know, um, expense reports, payroll, all this type of stuff. And they printed them on these big, huge sheets of dot matrix paper that um, were serrated or whatever, perforated. So you could make huge pieces of art if you wanted to. And I just had tons of this stuff as a kid. So I just was drawing since a, a really young age and I just never stopped. Nice. Life sucks. Why are you an antinatalist? And in addition to that, why are you an ethelist? Oh, I'm an antinatalist just because uh, I saw that, you know, even at a young age, I didn't, it seemed like my parents didn't really like um, having kids very much. I mean, they're, they're very busy and, you know, working hard. And uh, so just from that, point I didn't see it as a fun hobby that I ever wanted to start I never had any notion that having kids would be fun or a good idea and uh, then later when I you know was diagnosed as a depressive um, I thought oh maybe this is something I, I could give to my child if I had a child because I know that I kind of get depression from my mother's side of the family um, it's not something I would ever want to pass on so that, when I was a teenager that's what I I thought of as an antinatalism and I realized overpopulation was a, a, a big problem. There's only so many resources in the world. So I was kind of more of a pragmatic antinatalist. And then later on when I discovered Schopenhauer in college, I felt more that this was actually a philosophy and, and this is really a negative, like nobody should be procreating. And then it wasn't really until, you know, I discovered Benatar and Edmundum and um, <clears throat> Jim Crawford's there, Perry, that I just found that this philosophy and it just really fit right in with beliefs that I already had. And you ask why I'm an ethelist. Um, obviously, Edmundum had a huge influence and also Amanda did um, with her videos and her writings and postings all over the internet spreading ethelism and antinatalism. Um, and I agree with um, in Mendham that life is a zero sum game. You can't, there's really no benefit to anyone coming into existence. And that goes along with Benatar's, you know, asymmetry that coming into existence is always a harm. Um, so why would I do that? And um, I became a vegan about 12 years ago. I know it was 2009 because I made a note of it. And that's when I really started to become an activist. And I realized that I should probably do something. I could, it's not good enough for me just to not eat animals and to not procreate. I really should be helping um, spread this awareness. Well, first off, thank you so much for that, Matt. And you've been a huge influence on, on me as well. So I, I, I really want you to know that. Um, Matt, you are, of course, a splendidly accomplished professional artist uh, with huge talents in many mediums. Your YouTube videos are always, always so, uh, without fail, so polished, so professional, so beautifully put together. And your drawings, of course, 
just incredible. Um, we'll speak at length later on uh, about all about your channel, your art, and most recently, you know, your most recent astounding accomplishment, the ABCs of antinatalism, the coloring book, uh, which I have a copy of right here. Um, we'll talk all about that at great length in just a little bit. Um, but first, I just wanted to ask you some uh, more questions about antinatalism in general. Um, and just a few other subjects. Um, first off, what is your background in philosophy? Um, did you study it in school? And do you continue to you know, investigate new philosophy books, read new philosophy books? Or um, is it something that you, you know, continuously uh, are, are always investigating more about? Yeah, definitely. Someone actually just sent me um, Magnus Vending's book to my PO box. Nice. I, nice. You know, this is more of the um, kind of Peter Singer style um, utilitarianism, but, uh, interesting reads. I'm always reading about philosophy, but, uh, it actually started when I took martial arts training when I was about 15 and, uh, I had become an atheist, you know, a couple of years before that. So I was always looking for secular ethics and, uh, my dojo had a really nice library of Eastern thought and reading those books, um, like Zen and the martial arts, uh, showed me also that Western, religion and you know theism was just one type of religion and theism and that 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 awareness really makes you realize oh this is just a geographically based um fairy tale that every culture has so it solidified my atheism and uh taught me about eastern thought like i got really into Taoism, and uh, you know i now realize Taoism is more of I mean, it can be religious but like uh it's, uh, I don't know, it's just something that makes you think. It's not necessarily a philosophy. Um, but I got into that. And then when I got into college, I took Philosophy 101. And that's when I really started to actually buy philosophy books like uh, Schopenhauer. Uh, Schopenhauer really was kind of my gateway into philosophy because it was something that was readable to me and it's something I just agreed with based on my own experiences in life. So after I bought Schopenhauer's books, and I'd, I'd never read really if, a philosophy book like that from beginning to end. And I was just really infatuated with him. So I just started to read books on general philosophy. And uh, when I discovered, you know, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, I realized this was a step beyond Schopenhauer. Like this was really a system of ethics. And when I became a vegan, the utilitarianism in me just really came out and I just really studied it a lot more. And then Amendum kind of helped me discover that negative utilitarian side of util of utility that is the really more proper and logical form of the philosophy so uh, lately i've just been really diving more into native utilitarianism and yeah yeah i just want to get the timeline right so at 15 you were reviewing these eastern philosophy texts right right and then your intro to philosophy was that at school or when did that happen yeah i think that was Gosh, I think that it actually, for some reason, it happened in my third year of college. I, I didn't get it in my first year. For some reason, my philosophy 101 happened at uh, Eastern. Um, I just had a great philosophy professor. and uh, Everything up to Schopenhauer just seemed so ridiculous, like Descartes and Kant. And it, it was, <laughs> made no sense to me. I thought philosophy was bullshit for the first half of the class until we started talking about Schopenhauer. And then as soon as they introduced Schopenhauer, that's when you went into like reading his books. Uh... Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, you got into Mill and uh, Locke, right? Well, uh, Bentham and Mill were the okay. founders of utilitarianism, yeah. Okay, and, uh, and how did you get into negative utilitarianism? Well, uh, I remember reading, so I kind of, you know, left philosophy for a while. Um, and then when I got into veganism, um, I read an article that was really influential on me and it described different types of vegans. <clears throat> And it said, the most dedicated activists are utilitarians. Um, and they focus on the suffering of the greatest number, which in this article is talking about how chickens suffer in the egg industry, because there's just a, such a number and because they're actually tortured for their whole life. So I started really thinking about um, the philosophic calculus, you know, how, how you add up who needs the most help. And uh, that was really influential on me. And I really started trying to think about you know, this utilitarian calculus and how I can figure out where to divert my attention. And was it a natural progression to get into negative utilitarianism or was it like oh, a sorry, you're asking about the negative version? Yeah. yeah, it just made total sense to me. I have to say, Amendum was a huge influence on me. Um, 
finding it because most of the books on, on utility, they're all the classical utilitarianism. We really need a proper book or set of books about the negative version of the philosophy because yeah. uh, when I'm involved in utilitarian forums, they all ha have this strange obsession with you know happiness, whatever that even is. Because from what I understand, Gary doesn't use that term, right? No, he's not a big fan of it. Um, I, I like it for myself personally, because I think people who study philosophy immediately know where you stand. There was a period of time he was using it more. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, people informed him that it was a negative utilitarian perspective that right. he was, you know, speaking and yeah, there was a period of time where he was using it more, but I think he's he's since gotten a bit uh, tired of assigning that label to it. Right. Yeah. 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 And how yeah. long have you been in a negative utilitarian? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like when I discovered that article, it was probably ten years ago. Do you recall what the article, which what the name? I was? don't. I don't know if I ever even bookmarked it or anything, but it's just one of those things that you read, and it just had a, a big influence on me. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, when was the first time you think you heard the word antinatalism? I, I pretty sure I know what that is. That was um, on amazon.com because for whatever reason I was just looking for, I didn't even know what to call it. Anti-procreation or, you know, the ethics of procreation, I think was what I was looking for. And I immediately came across Benatar's book and it must not have been too much longer after it had been published. Um, I remember it was kind of an expensive paperback, so I think Jim Crawford's book was the first one I read, and then he deeply referenced Benatar, so then I had to get better than ever to have been to read that. Yeah. Yeah, people, I think, don't realize how instrumental Amazon is in connecting mm -hmm. people to the idea. Um, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, what or who have been your strongest antinatalist influences? Yeah, I would say... You know, the people I thanked in my coloring book would be um, David Benatar in Mendham and Amanda, probably been the biggest influences on me. And then uh, I would say I really like um, Diane Bandy or Diane Tenetalist because she's a YouTube activist. So like her activism yeah. inspires me also. So you discovered David Benatar after the Jim Crawford book, right? Well, around the same time, I'll say I just read I just read Crawford's first because it was shorter or something like that. It just seemed like more a more readable human story yeah. and I just I remember just read, read it over a couple of days and it, it just kind of blew my mind and made me just really think even more about <clears throat> that this is really a an important thing because I was more of a vegan activist at that time yeah so there was Jim Crawford then David Benatar and when did Inventum come into play I remember uh I know I was in this house so it, it was probably 10, 11 years ago, something like that. Um, I was looking up Jim Crawford, I think. And I found this guy with long blonde hair well, had a review video of that Confessions of an Antinatalist. And when I clicked on the video, all of these suggested videos popped up uh, you know, on the sidebar. And as soon as I started watching in Mendham, I, I just realized that this was a really, I didn't expect much, but I, I was just kind of blown away at, you know, this, the depth of his thought and his understanding of the world. It really, I was like, wow, this is something I need to, to watch more. And I just, uh, I, I think this might've been around the time when his channel was down or something. Cause I remember watching the in Mendham videos channel and just watching all the videos yeah. on there and uh gray Tai Cho, his videos are amazing. And um, in case people don't know, he takes clips of Inmendum and puts them to music and things and just makes them incredibly digestible. And that, it was just, as far as me as a video maker, his videos were hugely influential on me. Um, yeah, so, that, and I just have never stopped watching Inmendum. Like, I, there's no other YouTuber of, I've watched every single video they've made, at least since I discovered him. And, and sometimes I watch them two or three times to really digest them. Um, you're also... You really like the vegan activist Gary Yorofsky, right? I do, yeah. And he, he lives locally, so I've been able to meet him a couple times and work on projects with him. Uh, yeah, so he's a, he was a huge influence on me. I, I remember I went vegan around that time. Also, like it was actually, actually Ingrid Newkirk who kind of converted me 
to an animal rights activist, but his video came out soon after then. And it was a huge influence on me because his argument was just so well thought out and he had been honing it over years and years of doing lectures in colleges. So he just it kind of inspired me to, to make better arguments, you know, same with the men and both of them have such strong, well thought out arguments. And so like, that's actually what I wanted to bring up was, do you see some similarities between the two Gary's? Um, I mean, sure. They're, they're both very, dare I say, passionate about, about the truth and uh, about the suffering of animals. Yeah. And, and they're both kind of have a kind of an aggressive style, I guess you could say. Well, yeah, that's what I want to like, does that aggressive style um, speak to you in a, in a way? It does actually. I think because I remember one one time I was making an excuse for me eating. Um, my wife actually, I, I can't say enough about her influence on me. You know, becoming an animal rights activist because um, she was like a vegetarian; she wouldn't eat meat, and that, that's what I was cooking all the time. Um, and uh, I said some stupid excuse for to defending my meat eating and she was like don't even say that that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard and and her aggressive response to me the anger it really like made me like oh jesus i'm being an idiot that was really a stupid thing i just said you know it kind of put me in my place so i don't mind that that kind of aggressive type of argument because i responded to it yeah and amanda do you respond to that as well yeah i mean i think it is an important um i think sometimes you can't wake people out of their wake people up out of their ignorance and their refusal to change or consider things unless you do apply some aggression to it. I mean, I think that, I think unfortunately a lot of people can't be gently spoken to out of the harms that they do because they're so addicted it is the only thing that sort of does wake people up out of their addiction and be able to you know, look above the maze, so to speak, uh, of their addictions to certain things, unless there is some uh, verbal <laughs> aggression of some kind or another applied to it. So I, th I think it's a, it's a diff, it's a difficult, it's a controversial method of getting through to people. But I unfortunately think that it's very uh, necessary and positive in, in the way that a lot of people wield it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and sure, some people um, become really defensive, you know, but if people are really thinking, you know, they'll kind of take, take that and um, think about it. Yeah, for me, it's like the, because I've been trying to understand why um, when you get into involved in the atheist world, you know, there's the firebrand atheism, right? The more, uh, more aggressive type. And then when I personally got into, into the vegan stuff, I also uh, was uh, understood Gary Yarovsky. Then I got involved in the antinatalism stuff. And it seems like there's a, there's a method of communication that when it comes uh, aggressive, certain people are attracted to that. But some people, such as myself, my, I don't know, my psychological constitution for being able to engage in this type of dialogue, um, I do find it a, a hindrance. Um, to to temper the emotions so that I can get to the arguments, um, but uh, I think like I don't think it's a one one thing fits all kind of attitude. I think it's uh, yeah different people uh, uh, resonate with different uh, methods. It seems. Yeah, I think that's why like we just need more activists because yeah. someone will will appeal to you. You know, it will be your flavor of of activism or philosopher. I mean, if I could just jump in for a second, like there was, you know, when I first got into this community, uh, Jim was very, Jim Crawford was very active making videos for that period of time. We had derived energy and we had yeah. Amendum, and those were like the three strongest antenatal voices that were making, you know, YouTube content at, at the very least. And they're three very distinct flavors, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that kind of thing we've lost some of, at least in the, in the YouTube context, we've lost sort of uh instead of 31 flavors now, there's like two or, you know, maybe three or four. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as many flavors of activism or approaches as we can get, you know, the better. Um, yeah. Because it is, you know, it'd be great if we could find that silver bullet or that one key to everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, in absence of that, you know, have a whole set of keys made, you know? All right. Yeah, exactly. Um, what do you feel to be the strongest arguments for antinatalism? Well, those are the ones, of course, I thought about this greatly when I was making the antinatalism coloring book. I think consent is a great one. 
uh, in position, Benatar's asymmetry, um, and Menem's zero sum game argument. Um, I think they're, I don't know which one is the best. I think they're, they're all good. And then it's really all of them together. You just make a hammer that <laughs> just destroys natalism. I don't see how anyone can defend it. Do they all have equal power to you in terms of being convincing for antinatalism, or are there certain ones that you feel are more, I don't know. Um... Well, I guess Benatar's asymmetry is good. I mean, you can't deny that life is a harm, and that's really the, the I don't want to say immorality, but where the, the ethics come in, you know, or lack of ethics when, when someone's procreating is that they're sentencing someone to harm and death. So maybe the harm argument, I mean, H is for harm. Uh, yeah, you can't get over that. I mean, if you don't procreate, you don't harm and kill someone. If you do, you do harm and kill someone. Yeah. Um, what separates Ephilism from Benatarian antinatalism? I always thought of Ephilism as more of an activist um, philosophy. You know, like a Imenum doesn't want to just entertain people with philosophy. He's trying to get them to do something about it. Um, more than just not procreating for themselves, but convincing other people not to procreate at the very least. Um, it's very animal focused, wild animal focused, uh, maybe a little bit more than Benatar. I mean, I think they're very similar. But yeah, I think Imenum is really about getting people to do something, whereas Benatar is, you know, more of the academic side of it. Gotcha. Thanks. Do you actively consider yourself a Benatarian antinatalist as well as an Ephilist? I would, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I read, uh, oh, do I have it here? I, just, I was just going through it the other day, just making notes in, um, and doing underlining in his book. I mean, I check it out all the time just to refresh myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think to a large degree, I, I would also say the same. Um, what do you think of other antinatalist thinkers, such as, you know, Julio Cabrera, for example, or maybe, you know, Karima Kerma, or, you know, some of the other people out there that have, they're actively producing books and content. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not as familiar because they're not in the English language, but uh, I know Julio Cabrera um, is a deontologist or a Kantian, so his core philosophy I don't agree with. Um, and I know he's, he said some weird contradictory things, like he's, he's pro-abortion. Like, he's not, he's not anti-abortion. He's anti-abortion, sorry. Like he, he's not for abortion being illegal. Uh, so I, 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 his views are kind of confusing. That's what happens with Kantians. You know, they, they can't really be consistent ethically. Um, I mean, I'm sure he has a lot of good quotes about procreation, you know, but I don't think his, his whole idea that he invented some new negative ethics, I don't see how it's any different than just standard Kantianism, really. So I don't, I don't really follow them. But I mean, his books ever published in English, I, I might peruse it. How, how do you most engage with the antinatalist community? You know, in addition to making videos, I mean, what, uh, what other platforms are you active on? Oh, definitely YouTube. And uh, I do like to go into the philosophy forums on Reddit sometimes, but not necessarily the antinatalism forum because they're just preaching to the choir there. I like to go yeah. to the, like the utilitarianism uh, forum because there's just, you know, there's a need for people to talk about what kind of utilitarianism is important and antinatalism. Because yeah. the utilitarian um, ethics should point right towards antinatalism. And if right. they're not getting that, someone needs to tell them that. Do you like the negative utilitarianism subreddit, incidentally? Uh, sometimes. It's not, it doesn't seem to be all that active. Yeah. I, I just go in there once in a while. Yeah, I only just recently discovered it. And it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, not, it's not bad. But yes, I agree with you. Um, how does your antinatalism intersect with other social and ethical issues, such as atheism, veganism and the right to die yeah i think it, it intersects with all of them and yeah, especially veganism and that's that's one thing i've tried to do in my videos and other i know other anti have as well is tried to engage in the vegan community you know glenn Ost made a really good video about um durian rider trying because he has such an influence to try to bring him into the antinatalism because he's not quite there he, he sort of is but not really um so if they would you know they, he, i don't think he's ever mentioned the word um yeah, I think it's important that the people in those movements need to realize that their beliefs would intersect with antinatalism if they knew about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will say, um, I don't think that he he's ever said the word antinatalism, but I do remember that, uh, and maybe this was the video that Glenn Oss responded to, there was that period of time where 
uh, Doreen Ryder and, and uh, Freely, you know, had, I think made a child free video. Mm -hmm. And that was the yeah. first sort of crossover I can think of, yeah. you know, between the antinatalist and, and uh, vegan. Movements. Oh yeah. And yeah. You know, even though I have like, disagree disagreements with Doreen Ryder, but he, he influenced so many people to get so many men to get vasectomies. I just yeah. can't deny that he's had a, a great anti-procreative influence on the world. <clears throat> Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I would have to agree. Um, do you have any thoughts on the subject of promortalism and how it relates or does not relate to antinatalism? And how do you define this term? Yeah, you know, I just realized when I was reading Benatar the other day, he does mention that word promortalism. I don't know if that was the first yeah. mention of that word. Um, but he's, he kind of saw it as, it was, it was on his chapter on extinction, because I was kind of researching for this talk we're going to have in the future about extinction. And, uh, you know, he said that, that would end, involve killing. You know, promortalism seems to involve actively killing. I, I, you know, I don't know if it means being like an Einsatzgruppen and going around and just killing all the people and animals to, to forward extinction, or if it's just related to suicide. I kind of, because of uh, Ji Woon Huang's um, promotion of that word, it seemed to me it meant, it meant you should just commit suicide to avoid future suffering. Yeah, it's a, it's a term that seems to have a great multitude of, of, of interpretations at this point. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts on the subject of transhumanism and how it relates or does not relate to antinatalism? Well, that's kind of my problem with this. So he seems to be from the negative utilitarian view, but the book, oh, okay, it doesn't say in the title, but he's really about reducing suffering, not ending suffering. Um, so that's my difference with the transhumanist community. Like, I mean, I love Brian Thomas's website. It's just great. So much information about wild animal suffering, but for some reason they want to preserve life instead of just turning it off, which would seem to be the ideal way to end suffering. Like you're never going to, I don't think you're ever going to get rid of it, even if you try to reduce it. Unless you get rid of life. Uh, Matt. Why do you hate Kant so much? <laughs> oh, I just don't feel it's a rational philosophy. I think that um, anyone can, you know, Kant kind of told people, you make up what you think should be a universal rule. You know, so it seems like someone who thinks molesting children is, is great for him, they can just say, oh, I would like it to be a universal law that everyone lets me molest their children. Whereas I think the concept of utility, every utilitarian who understands the facts and agrees on the facts has to come to the same conclusion because it's just a math problem, really. Hmm. How do you ground in a utilitarian framework um, rights? Like, yeah, I, I guess you just can't, right? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe in rights. Correct. I think, is it Bentham who said that um, rights is nonsense on stilts? Hmm. Or no, rights is nonsense, and natural rights is natural rights are nonsense on stilts. Yeah. So, how do you develop a framework of justice when you abandon rights like that? Well, then when you get into law, I mean, that's kind of something different. You have this whole social contract thing, and I mean, you try. I think you should have the concept of utility influence the laws that are made. So, okay, so social contract can be um, expanded upon from utilitarianism. Sure. Okay. So would you also consider yourself a social contract theorist? No, not really. I, I guess I, could, I wouldn't commit to that. It's just some, something we have to have a contract to kind of be civilized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to go back to Kant, it's like uh, you don't, it, it seems arbitrary that of right. his categorical imperative. Correct. Yeah, because it's not necessarily based on any concept like utility to make you know, Kant's rules. And, and also, it's, it's just a very inflexible philosophy, whereas utility is very flexible. Like, is killing right or wrong? There's no standard utilitarian a answer. It's totally dependent on circumstances. Whereas Kant would say something like, oh, lying's always bad. It's bad for a society, or whatever, but there's obviously circumstances for lying would be good. But the Kantian philosophers do take into account certain contexts where those rules can be shifted, right? Yeah, and to me, that they're just making it an already convoluted philosophy even more convoluted by having the, you know, like threshold deontology and things like that. It just seems like a completely irrational, um, I don't know, worldview to me. 
but if you're just if you're trying to decide between deontology and utilitarianism, which seems to be, you know, the two prevalent uh, theories out there, what advice would you give someone to figuring out what they would be aligned with? Well, I think they should just be a utilitarianism, a utilitarian. Like there's there's no really real reason for Kant, in my opinion. Mm. Or, or Hegel or any of these, you know, philosophers from that era, you know, except Schopenhauer, but even Schopenhauer wasn't a utilitarianism. Although I, I did mention one video, he was, I thought he was kind of an, a utilitarianism before the philosophy existed, but, you know, idealism was kind of the norm in his day. Yeah. You've spoken a little bit about effective altruism in your videos and how effective altruists have a sort of blind spot when it comes to extinction and antinatalism. Can you speak a little bit more on your feelings about that? That's something I'm trying to develop a video on because the person who sent me this uh, Magnus Vending book is a um, effective altruist and he has a lot of disposable income and he, he was asking my advice where to send it. And I was like, geez, I don't really know. Like if, if I give any money, I, I'll give to my local farm sanctuary because I know that that goes right into those animals' mouths, uh, you know, buys them food. <sighs> I know that my wife and I used to give a lot to PETA but uh, then I realized that PETA is just really flush with cash. And they, you know, a lot of these charities, they just have, even the, the sanctuary I used to give to, or I still do sometimes, they, uh, they have a rich Indian benefactor. And that's, he supplies almost all of the money. You know, any money we give, it just, it just burns up so quickly. And because all these cows to feed is so expensive. Um, so, yeah, I just feel like uh, there's this, uh, theory with effective altruists that the more even if you have a job doing something unethical like working for i don't know a bank or exxon or some you know corporation that has negative utility the fact that you're getting money from them to give to charity is a positive but in the the final summation i don't know if that's really the best way to go about it i mean I, you know, I guess I guess just support the activists you who, who do need funds or something like hey i know gary yarofsky he needed money to go around the country travel funds you know and he obviously was someone i would be willing to support uh, he has a great website too and well yeah i think i'll i'll try to flesh out my my thoughts on effective altruism but you know, um, does, that, does that help answer your question yeah thank you one one thinker that um uh, kind of goes across the board with um effective altruism veganism and utilitarianism uh, is peter singer what it, yeah. what's your opinion on peter singer you know, he wrote Animal Liberation, which is, of course, one of the most important books in animal rights. You might even say it kind of started modern animal rights. And that book is what influenced Ingrid Newkirk, who influenced me to become a vegan. And uh, so Peter Singer kind of indirectly helped found PETA. Um, but, uh, you know, he he's said that he doesn't even eat vegan now. <laughs> like he, he says, oh, it's if it's convenient, he will. Um, obviously, he's a breeder. He's had children. Uh, he flies all over the world, you know, blowing all this, you know, uh, jet fuel to go on talks and stuff. And so he's just kind of living the life of a celebrity philosopher. Like he is probably one of the most well-known philosophers and definitely the most well-known utilitarian. But the fact that he hasn't accepted the negative version of the philosophy, I think, is a big problem. As you know, Matt, anti-procreation is sometimes broken up into four general schools of thought, uh, antinatalism proper, ethilism, vehement, the voluntary human extinction movement, and child-free. Um, can you share some of your thoughts with me about each? Okay, um, I mean, child-free, um, I agree with some, there was some critic of antinatalism saying we need to embrace more of ch the child-free and I actually don't think it's a bad idea as, as a way to reach people, you know, mm -hmm. try to promote the, maybe making videos promoting the child-free lifestyle, which is something I haven't yep. really done yet, but might be valuable. And then people can watch other videos on the channel about antinatalism proper. Um, and of course, vehement the problem with, with that philosophy, even though like, you know, Les United also, he's done so much to, to convince men to get vasectomies. You know, when I got my vasectomy, I, printed out the golden snip award from this website for myself did um, you i love yeah. that so i don't like to say too much negative about vehement but you know they i think he has a misunderstanding of, of the fact of wild animal suffering like he thinks that human to an, humans you know causing suffering to animals has a greater amount of disutility than 
animals killing each other in nature. And I think the numbers just show that it's the opposite, that the wild animal suffering is, is the worst um, by far. And so I, I don't understand preserving the biosphere, which is vehement is for, therefore human extinction, not all animal extinction. So that's child-free vehement. And then what were the other two? Uh, just ephalism, I think, was the only one that you did. Oh, okay, and then on ephalism, yet. of course, I think it's the best, best of antinatalism, in my opinion. <laughs> Wait, okay, can I uh, jump in with that? Why is it the best out of them? Like, if you're negative utilitarian, right? You got the benevolent world exploder in there, right? Right. You got philosophical pessimism. Right. You got antinatalism. What's, <clears throat> what is ephalism? Like, why is that the, the one for you? Oh, I just think it's the most logical. I think uh, Imendum's arguments are pretty rock solid. And, I mean, like we were saying, it's not too different than Benetarian antinatalism. Um, you know, I mean, uh, Benatar agrees that, you know, life is not worth starting and coming into existence is a harm. So, uh, you know, he's pro-extinction. Um, yeah, I just think in Menem's arguments are so well thought out. And uh, I also agree with, you know, his stance on activism that we should do something. I think that does different, differentiate him from Benatar where Benatar thinks that Ephelis are optimists, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's, I don't know if that answers your question. What type of activism would Ephelis or uh, Inmenhem advocate for? Well, spreading awareness and education, definitely. I think it's first. Um, but, you know, Inmenhem also has ideas to influence politics and, and economics, which does kind of go beyond, you know, Benatar didn't really talk about those things, how to improve society and, and civilization. Um, before we uh, talk in more detail about your YouTube channel and, and again, all the art that you've done, I did want to ask you just a little bit about your uh, vegan and animal rights activism. Um, when did you first become a vegan? Um, I know you spoke a little bit about this already, um, but when, when did you, you know, first get involved with animal rights activism? Yeah, it was around 2009. And I just, I remember when I used to be on Facebook, I made a Facebook post about it. Yeah, so I remember it. Yeah. And yeah, it was because my girlfriend, who's my wife now, uh, did not eat animals. <clears throat> and so I just started making meals without animals in them. And I just realized, oh, I don't, I can get used to this. I don't, you know, I thought it was such a terrible thing to have to give up hamburgers and uh, chicken and all these things I, I like to eat. And I also, because I'm, I'm into resistance training, I, all the books I've read on, on weightlifting and bodybuilding, they're all like, oh, don't eat meat eat double the meat you know they said oh you got to have meat to build muscles and I, I believe that nonsense so once I started eating like a vegetarian diet at first I realized that uh, this is not necessary and that, that was really helped yeah. me let go of that addiction um, yeah and then I started watching like Freely and Gary Urofsky and they helped me kind of get into that vegan lifestyle um, and it, as soon as I like, you know, saw Gary's speech and, and saw that really what made me stop eating meat was a, a movie called I Am an Animal, the Ingrid Newker story or the P story of PETA. It was an HBO documentary. And I liked that one because it's, it wasn't made by PETA, you know, it was about PETA. So it, all, they'd had, all they did is follow her around and just, I get kind of goosebumps just thinking about her because, you know, that, that changed my life. Like that was the last day I ate meat was that day. Oh, and wow. I just realized that I had to be more like her. Like she just, uh, it made me feel like a piece of shit as a human being. And I just felt I had to really up, up my game. So I just was trying to rack my brain. What can I do to help? And uh, I discovered my local a animal sanctuary and I've, I've done some films for them. And just cause I'm trying to think of things that I can do with like my talents, my abilities. Were you involved in any animal rights organizations? Well, we were in, you know, remember it's PETA, or I think we might still be. Um, and, you know, my local farm sanctuary, um, I haven't really done much for any, I guess, animal rights organizations, except maybe spread awareness of them, but I don't like necessarily belong to them or anything. Are there any animal rights philosophers that uh, you would recommend? Hmm, well, in Mendham, I mean, he makes great animal rights videos. Um, someone cut together like a lot of Mendham's 
arguments together, you can find it on YouTube. That's a good video. Um, you know, like, unfortunately, like we talked about during Ryder before, he doesn't really make animal rights videos anymore. He just talks about bicycles. So, uh, Freely is making videos, but they're mostly about the health benefits of veganism. I don't know. It, can you, I mean, who are some of your favorites? Are there anyone that I'm missing? Um, well, I don't know if I have any, I don't know if I have any favorites, but I I'd be curious about your thoughts on people like um, Earthlings Ed, uh, Joey Cardstrong, uh, Vegan Gains. Well, actually, I think you, yeah, you've commented on Vegan Gains before. Yeah, I still uh, follow him. Oh, and uh, your favorite buddy, Ask Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ask Yourself, his, his philosophy is so convoluted for me. I don't watch his videos anymore. Um, I mean, I'm glad he's making vegan arguments. You know, Name the Trait is a pretty good argument. Um, I do watch Vegan Gains, but part of that's just because I'm into weight training. So we have that in common. Um, but the other guys I don't subscribe to too much just because I'm just really into antinatalism right now. Um, I like Goji Man. He's, he talks a lot about the health benefits of, of veganism and he, you know, dispels all these myths and he does a lot of good videos about, um, um, you know, vegan diets and stuff. But since I, I've been vegan for so long now that I just don't even really need that information anymore for myself. But I, I share some of those videos sometimes. What's your opinion on, uh, on natural vegan? <laughs> can i say it on this podcast <laughs> mark <laughs> yeah i think she's she's a troll account really um i i when she first came out i wondered oh is she like a plant by the meat industry or something because <laughs> like she says oh don't it's okay vegan viewers go have leather if you just need leather you know if you don't make your cool shoes vegan go ahead and buy them I mean, that's not the kind of vegan i would ever endorse or watch and how about uh, perspective philosophy? Because he's had, I don't know, like maybe five conversations on antinatalism now. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you think about his, uh, his channel? I like that he, he has antinatalists on there for sure. I like that a lot. But, you know, he's into Hegel and that's even worse than Kant. I don't know. I don't understand <laughs> that at all. <laughs> I mean, even Schopenhauer in his time said Hegel was um, sham wisdom. It is. It's just yeah, it's stupid. I don't know why he's so into it? But uh, I mean, I, I like that he he's very active, and you know, obviously he's very pro animals. So yeah, I like him. Yeah, and another person that's been bringing up wild animal suffering is uh, Humane Hancock, and um, he had a conversation with Cosmic Skeptic too about that. Oh, okay, good. Um, so I think uh, the, oh, well, I, I don't know if it was wild animal suffering or if it was just antinatalism, but uh, yeah, those are relatively two new. Um, people that have been making videos on this topic. So uh, yeah, it seems like there's quite a diversity uh, in the vegan world talking about multiple subjects of wild animal suffering, effective altruism, and at least they're entertaining the idea of antinatalism, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. uh, little by little. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, if, if um, professor philosophy, you know, just has an antinatalist on his channel, that'll introduce the idea. To yeah. People, you know, like I know, one that vegan lawyer, even though she's, I don't agree with her views because she's kind of like a conservative or something, but uh, she had an anti discussion. I'm sure that exposed some new people to it. Um, in one of your videos, you point out the results from a 2017 survey by somebody named Thomas Blank, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, of antinatalists, I think surveyed on Facebook groups. And this revealed that under 30% of antinatalists that had participated in this survey were <laughs> vegans. Um, can you share with me your feelings on this horrifying bit of news? <laughs> yeah, I think I think in one of my early videos I talked about that, and I was horrified because I thought that um, the two philosophies go together so well. And obviously, if you're against suffering, you wouldn't be for the birth of animals to be tortured and slaughtered. I mean, especially eggs. It's, I mean, it's it's beyond like Nazi level. It's just horrible. I, I, so and it seems like so. I, I think that I need to do more about egg awareness because people don't realize how awful these yeah. animals have it. Um, yeah, I, I think you know. I unfortunately, I don't really like to make videos negative about other antinatalists. You know, I, yeah. I do. I do want our community to be you know cohesive. But I did make a response video to um, the friendly antinatalist because she's not a vegan. And I, you know, I just used her video as an, as an example of, because she's one of the few who, you know, admitted it on camera and, and made a, you know, decent video about it. She was talking about the um, hypocrisy of vegans who have kids, which is also a problem. 
Um, but then I said, well, it's also hypocrisy for an antenatalist who understands that birth is a harm to bring more sentient animals just because they're not human, just because they have hoofs instead of feet doesn't mean it's fine to bring them into existence and torture them. It's a very unfortunate circumstance. And um, I mean, when I first started in the YouTube antinatalist world, crossover between the vegan community and the antinatalist community was like next to nothing. And like we said earlier, I think, I think, I think in part that freely, you know, Durian Ryder video did do something to shake it up a little bit in those early days. Um, you know, even though the subjects are so closely related um, and at, you know, at least, you know, most of the public participants in the antenatal world are vegan. Uh, the communities are, are still so separate and by and large, they continue to be. Um, uh, but, you know, even though there has been some development over the last 10 years or so. So what do you think, if anything, can be done to join the two movements more closely together? Yeah, I think just spreading awareness. And I do think making response videos, even though YouTube's just a small bit of the whole activism world. Um, yeah, making response videos to, to vegans and trying to get them to talk about the subject. You know, like we were just talking about some vegans have talked about it. But that's something I do think about a lot. Um, maybe going to vegan events and stuff and talking about the subject would be helpful. Like I thought about maybe, yeah. maybe I should have a table at the, um, you know, annual veg fest in Detroit. Maybe that would be a good idea. Cause like there's uh, not every booth at the local veg fest is about veganism. There's the, um, it's an atheist organization there. Uh, uh, I forget what it's called, but uh, you know, so there's an atheist table there. And the, interesting. There's an even, there's usually a Christian vegan booth there about, you know, of course the Bible you can interpret any way, but this person interprets the Bible that you should be vegan. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, I think it's a great idea. I would love to see that kind of activism, you know, more take place booths mm -hmm. and just, you know, places where you can go talk to an antinatalist, you know, about yeah, yeah. And all kinds of page, things. Page out of Les Unite's book, you know, where he, he goes out yeah. and talks to people in public. Yeah. Oh, I love videos watching him do that. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's so inspiring. Yeah. You said that you, you've met Gary Yarofsky a few times. Yeah. Uh, do you think you would ever try to write or speak to him about antinatalism? Do I you think th he would be receptive to it at I all? I didn't think about that. I mean, uh, he has responded to my email, so I could ask him. I just don't want to bother him. But I, if I saw him in person, I think I, I would probably ask him about it. What do you think That's his cool. reaction would be? Well, I'm quite, I have met him and his wife, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to have kids. So I think he would be receptive to it. But and because I know he's a misanthrope also, but whether he whether he would be for world extinction, I almost doubt it. Yeah, I think he'd probably be for human extinction. Mm. You just yeah, you mentioned that misanthrope. Um, do you consider yourself a misanthrope? Um, I guess I do, even though I know in Mendem has said he doesn't like that word. Um, or maybe it implies some kind of bias. Like, I think humans can be better than they are. But as a whole, I'm quite disgusted by, by humans and how we really haven't lived up to our potential at all. And I, I don't like people. Like, I, you know, I, I bought every, every place I move, I keep trying to get away from them more and more. And so I bought this place that has five acres, but it's just not far enough from them at all. Like, I, I still have to deal with neighbors and uh, I still have to hear them shooting their guns off all the time. And my one neighbor over here has chickens to exploit them, of course, for their eggs. So, although I, I mean, I guess I'd rather have them get their eggs there because these chickens have better lives than the ones in battery cages, but still I have to hear their rooster all freaking day. Yeah. But you enjoy like the antinatalist community, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the antinatalists are pretty good people I've found for the most part. And yeah, there's some bad ones too, but. Andy Nalis seems to be some of the most caring people I've ever met. Gotcha. Okay. Um, in that vegan couple activism uh, tour review video, which was a really great video on your channel, um, it's stated that the best forms of activism are one, bearing witness, two, silent protest, three, direct action. Do you feel these apply to antinatalism as well? Yeah, that was their opinion. Those are the best forms of activism. Um, I don't know how you would bear witness to procreation. Like if you'd go to yeah. a maternity ward or something, I mean, that could have negative utility too. It could give Antonius a bad reputation. 
but yeah, I think I, I talked about in that video that um, I don't know if I don't know if that's bearing witness is really it's not something I would really want to do, like especially when it comes yeah. to animals, because I, I would just I would lose my mind if I if I had to see them going into the slaughter room. I, I don't know. I might yeah, do something same. reckless. Yeah. And I'm sorry, what were the the other two? Uh, uh, no, no, no. It's okay. Direct action and silent protest. Yeah, I think direct action it seems to be pretty helpful. Like people do those cubes of truth and stuff. Um, I mean, that exposes people on the street who never would have come across a video. Um, I just watched a video today of Diane uh, and her friend Alex out protesting in the street with a big sign that says Google antinatalism. I mean, I think that's brilliant. I think you should do that. I mean, I think it does help to probably be a people person like Danny Shine, you know, or I, I probably wouldn't do what Danny Shine does. I'm just too shy to do that, I think. But um, just holding a sign up that speaks for itself, I think that's really good activism. Yeah, absolutely. Um, related to this topic, topic, we are, of course, all three of us actually sentiocentric antinatalists. You, and you and I, Matt, are ethalists. Um, but a great deal of the antinatalist community are anthropocentric antinatalists, meaning they don't include the animals in antinatalism and are not concerned at all with sentient extinction as opposed to uh, human extinction, if they're extinctionists at all, actually. Right. That's, not, that's another whole thing. Um, what do you think is the best way of getting through to anthropocentric antinatalists? Well, <clears throat> I kind of hate videos that show animals suffering like in the wild. Like it's really disturbing to me. It just, it just depresses me, even though I know what's happening. You know, I'm well aware of it. Um, so I don't really need to see. I always hated nature shows as a kid. Hated the fuck out of them. <laughs> um, but maybe they just need to be, maybe it needs to be shoved in some people's faces, you know, that this is what's happening and how can you possibly let this go on? Um, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you know, like we are so into, humans are so into getting, get rid of cancer and killing cancer. Why wouldn't you be against um, horror elsewhere? Yeah, it's a real, it's a real tough one. I mean, you know, with the Ethelist, like, I kind of had, like, this weird moment there for a minute where I was like, do I insert footage of animals getting ripped apart? Because it just yeah. didn't feel like that it was my place to do that. You know, it's like, it's yeah. almost like steal, you, <laughs> ste you know, stealing their pain in a weird right, way. Right. So that's why I did, like, the whole faces, you know, but. Yeah, we, yeah, that was, that. I love the animation or those fish. Oh, thank either. you. That's so great. Um, thank you. Thank you. But yeah, we don't we necessarily have to show it. We can describe it. I know Amendum doesn't love to show yeah. that footage. I appreciate that from him. Um, you can just describe it. Just describe the attrition in numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Just the cold hard facts of it. Yes. Yeah. Matt, I just wanted to t uh, touch briefly on the subject of uh, vasectomy, as you've made at least two videos on your channel about your own experience with, with having a vasectomy. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, just what your experience was like and, you know, advice to maybe anybody out there that's listening to this thinking about having it done? Yeah, I, w I mean, I wish I had done it earlier. It would have um, cured me a lot of my anxiety. I mean, every time I had some kind of sexual encounter, I had to freak out, even though if, even if you use protection, protection can fail. Um, yeah, I was 39 and it was kind of interesting when I went in the doctor for some reason saw the three as a two and he tried to talk me out of it. He thought I was 29. Um, and I said, Oh doc, that's a three. He's like, Oh, never mind." So I don't know if he assumed I'd already had a kid or not, but it was, it was no problem for me. And, and actually speaking of that vegan couple, um, they were a big influence on me because they made a video like showing for almost from beginning to end. I think they even had a camera in the room when the doctor was performing the vasectomy. And that uh, made, made it easier for me to do it because I knew what to expect. So I, yeah, I wish I would have done that. I mean, that was just, that video was just great that they did. Um, what's kind of funny is I heard that they got a complaint from uh, someone who came to that talk because uh, there was some parents who brought their vegan kids there, but they were not vegan. And one of them just was sitting at our table and was kind of horrified. That I was thanking them so much for their vasectomy video because we don't want to bring new people into the world. <laughs> Little fun, awkward moment there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, bat, we, before we get back to the subject of an proper, I did want to ask you uh, quite a bit about your artistic background. Of course. Um, when did you first start making art, Matt? Matt? Yeah. Like I was saying in the beginning, um, my parents didn't necessarily want to make an artist out of me. 
my dad wanted me to be, uh, he said, I, I thought you were going to be in some think tank in Washington by now when I was in my 20s, even though I was like, I have no interest in doing that really. Um, but that's kind of the life he wanted. But he kind of set me up for that because he really tried to educate me in world affairs when I was growing up. And that's probably why I'm such a history buff now. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just that drawing desk when I was a kid. Uh, there wasn't, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, so there wasn't a lot of stuff to do. I had an Atari 2600, but I'd play, after I'd play those games for a while, I'd get pretty bored. We only had like a few channels on TV. So my brother and I would just draw and draw and draw all day, every day. And that's basically how it started. And I just never stopped. And then when I started going to art classes, you know, as a child, my um, teachers kind of saw something in me. And I, I'll always remember those teachers. I had a really bad one in, the, in elementary or middle school. But my elementary school one was just really pushed me to take classes outside of school. Um, so that kind of helped push me in that direction as well. And then in college, I didn't know if I could make a living at it. Um, so it wasn't really till after college when I discovered um, computer animation and self-taught myself that I realized, oh, there's, there's this new industry building up and uh, advertising agencies are basically only going to do computer art now. Like if you look at any magazine or anything or commercial, it's all computer generated art now. So I was just kind of lucky that I got into it as a hobby because I wanted to make films. Um, and so that training of myself came in to end up becoming a career. Cool. What are some of your favorite artists and how have they influenced you? Well, anyone who knows my channel probably knows I, I love comedy. I just think it's, to me, it's the most, most beautiful art form. I know beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but it's just, just that you can just have, you know, this, this little brush, and this little thing of ink and some paper, and you can just make a piece of art that could change someone's life or, or give them some awe or horniness even. Um, it's just kind of amazing to me that someone so can come out of someone's brain through their arm. Um, so yeah, comic book arts are, are probably my favorite artists. Like uh, Jim Apero was the comic book artist who was drawing Batman, reading Batman. So I collect his uh, uh, books in black and white if I can and study them. Uh, there's an artist named David Finch who's big on YouTube right now. He's like, he left his, he started making videos, I don't know, seven or eight years ago and then he abandoned it. And but he just now came back like, like a tidal wave and just started making tons of great, if anyone's into drawing, I recommend his, his YouTube channel for tutorials. Oh um, yeah, I just love his style. Um, there's too many artists probably to mention, but those are two I really like. Is there a particular style of art that you'd most like to do? Um, <clears throat> black and white illustration, but then, and then add color to it. But yeah, that's, that's just my favorite. I just think it's just the starkness maybe of the, the black ink on the white paper is just so gorgeous to me. Um, so bold. But I, as you know, I also love computer animation. I really enjoy that too. And filmmaking and photography also. Yeah, definitely. I, you've talked a little bit about this in your videos, but what was your art school experience like? I mean, it wasn't, was it art school proper? It was, it was some... It was, it was university. Yeah. I, university, I should have okay. gone to an art school. Actually, I really wanted to go. My dream since I was a kid, I saw this video. It was hosted by Frank Gorsham who played uh, the Riddler. And I just found it in Kmart one time. It was called Comic Book Collector. And I think it was just to take advantage of the Batman movie that had just come out. And in that movie, he talked about the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is where I want to go. But uh, when it came time to choose a college, um, my depression and anxiety just is the first time I had a, a nervous breakdown in my life. And that really scared the hell out of me. So the idea of going to Manhattan by myself and the fact that it'd be hugely expensive to move and live there. I had to abandon that idea. And I had to abandon the idea of going even to, um, like there's a, a school of art in Pittsburgh. And I think there was one in Illinois, maybe. No, is there one in Kalamazoo I was thinking about going to, but I felt like I had to stay close to home because I was just, I was a wreck and I was under yeah. psychiatric care and stuff. So I just decided to go to the local university. Well, first I went to uh, community college for two years and those credits transferred to the local university and I couldn't afford the University of Michigan so I went to Eastern Michigan University which started out as like a teacher college you know 100 years ago but now it's a full university and I majored in fine art but I was really disappointed because they're like well if you want to be an artist you should take the fine art program and, and minor in art history but when I got there I was like ah, they're they're 
like, because I had to pay for, I don't know, about a quarter of my college. My parents thankfully paid for the rest, but I still had to work all through college and pay for all my books and everything. So I'm like, why am I paying this guy? He's just setting up a still life every day and I'm drawing a still life and he's critiquing it. Why the hell am I paying all this money for this? I can just do that on my own because I'm yeah. mostly self-taught. So I actually switched majors to English literature because I wanted to study writing. I wanted to be, I basically wanted to be a graphic novelist. I wanted to write and draw books. Um, so then I finished college. And that's really all my dad wanted. He just wanted me to finish college. And uh, but if I would have gone to an art school, like there's a an art school in Detroit that's um, the Center for Creative Studies. That a lot of mm -hmm. my colleagues have gone to, but it's it's also really expensive. And yeah. I didn't want to go downtown Detroit. I don't feel like it's very safe. And I've, I've had no. stories of my friends who've gotten mugged before. I'm like, no, no, not worth it. <laughs> so, um, but what they did get out of that is they got connections, and that's something that I did not have in my schooling so once I get out of, got out of college I didn't know what the hell I was going to do and that's part of kind of what led to my like nervous breakdown halfway through college um so I just started learning 3d animation because a friend of mine worked in the video game industry and he said oh this is the software you should get and learn it was 3d studio max at the time and yeah I just started doing tutorials and put together a portfolio and then I started working on independent films locally and you know for free but I really cut my teeth on those and it gave me the ability to put something together that I could show an employer and then just how it always is, it's who you know. I just happened on a movie set to meet a guy who he was just there to be an extra in a zombie movie, but he happened to be a 3D artist working in the local advertising industry. And just meeting him just it was a life-changing experience because he's like, oh, bring your, your demo reel. And, you know, and I got in, got my foot in the door, and that led to like a 20-year career doing computer animation. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think, you, I think you did it the right way. I mean, I think, you know, art school – Unfortunately, art school proper, you know, some of these bigger, you know, they, it, it, it's a mixed bag. I mean, they can destroy you as an yeah. artist just as easily as they can make you as, as an artist. I've mm -hmm. seen that happen lots of times and it almost yeah. happened to me. And um, I think at the end of the day, no matter what kind of education, you know, formal education you get in the arts, it's that constant thirst for teaching yourself that's the most important and you ha you've had that in spades, uh, obviously. So, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and especially in this, like, very technical type of stuff you have to just have to keep learning the technology keeps changing like no now choice. yeah now a computer animation it's all becoming this real time stuff so you're almost like you're, you're working in like a video game yeah more than just a proper 3d application yeah yeah and if you don't have a knack for that kind of stuff it's <laughs> it's kind of game over <laughs> yeah it so. did help that I, i'm really into computers yeah i yeah. was always hanging out in the computer lab in high school I have to be to learn Maya and all these, mm -hmm. all these programs. Right. So for sure. Yeah. Um, so as, as you've just said, I mean, you've had, you've worked as a professional artist for a long, long time now doing a wide variety of things. Um, and you, you've spoken a little bit about your professional art, uh, you know, history in professional art. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the, the comic books that you've worked on professionally? Um, I've mostly do, just done things like back covers and stuff like that. So I, I don't really have much okay. of a, um, career and I did try to make a real go at it around 2003 2004 like I went to the um, Chicago comic-con okay. and took took my portfolio around and uh, it was interesting interesting experience it was disheartening in some ways but uplifting in others it depended who I talked to like I talked uh luckily I have a friend of mine who's he was kind of he's in the toy side of the industry but he knew everybody who to show my portfolio to and what I did is I drew a 22 page comic book which is the length of a usual comic book and I, I wrote it, illustrated it, colored it, everything, and brought it there. And I thought I could get some work from it. But uh, this one guy, was he was like kind of a, a rep for artists. Yeah. So he gets people gigs, you know. And uh, he was like, oh, this, this is okay, but here, let me show you something. And he's like, here's some pieces I got, you know, at the last convention. And I was like, god damn, <laughs> like, this is so much above where I am. And uh <sighs> That was very disheartening, but then I talked to some of the smaller indie publishers, and like, oh, we we like your stuff. You know, call us yeah. up, we'll we'll work with you. But it was for free. You know, I would be working yeah. for free. And comic book art is is so time consuming and hard. That you know, I was working at the time is punishing. <clears throat> yeah, I just realized that <clears throat> the time it was going to take me to get good uh, is going to have to be drawing constantly every day and uh, improving. And I didn't really have the time. And I no guarantee of making money like that's why computer yeah. animation really took over at that time because I not only made money I made really good money and I just couldn't there's just no looking back at that point unfortunately but I did I did do um, some back covers that got published and 
Yeah. I mean, it's still my dream to to do books and things. Um, and I think I'm a better artist than I was now. So maybe someday. And now, now that self-publishing is so easy, I could just publish my own graphic novels. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, especially after the release of the coloring book, I mean, you have this, this you know, really quite extraordinary thing under your belt now. I mean, do you, do you, have you considered it all perhaps, you know, independently producing an antinatalist comic? Do you think that's something you'd have an interest in, in doing later Potentially, on the Potentially, maybe what might be a good idea is a, something like science fiction or something that would appeal to a broader audience that has an antinatalist character, you know, the kind of a true detective kind of thing. Yeah. Might even be a better idea, you know. Definitely. Yeah, I love that idea. I think that'd be phenomenal. And, and do you think movie making is something that you would have an interest in getting back oh, into? Definitely, definitely. Like some of my friends are filmmakers and I was, it, I learned so much just working on their films, even though I was working for free. Uh, I just learned a lot about cinematography and editing and um, working with actors and that kind of thing. And I, I'd hoped to make some short films, at least when I was on this property, but uh, I don't, it, it's kind of intimidating. Like to, to, cause you have to convince people like us to work for you, like for little to no pay and that kind of thing. And yeah um just drawing a, a story i don't have to depend on anyone but myself but yeah definitely i, I want to make more films and i have two films planned one of them for your film festival but it probably won't be i would probably won't get there this year maybe next year but it'd probably be a computer animated film sweat that that's amazing news but yeah don't worry there'll be there'll be more years of the film festival so next time for sure that sounds great um in one of your early videos and i'm sorry that i, I failed to write down exactly which one it is and i'm paraphrasing on top of it but you say to something to the effect of you know you want to create a, a synthesis of art activism and money which i i kind of think you you've you really have done you know in some respects uh you know in, in a really beautiful way too you know with the, the etsy and just all of these things that you're doing for activism doing independently um can you tell me a little bit more about this as as a goal that you're working towards well i i don't remember what i said about it but uh i mean yeah it would be nice if the activism could produce income to do more activism i mean yeah you know like a I don't even know how much the the coloring book is making, but uh, I'd like to invest in more art tools, you know, like a, a tablet yeah. or something. Um, yeah, I mean, it would just give me the ability to maybe do activism full time. That would be nice. Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. I just I, I love people that are that are working towards that and kind of creating like a like almost kind of like a cottage industry out of their antinatalist mm -hmm. activism. I think like you to some extent, Andreas with the magazine, uh, but also Extinctionist Records. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's just this yeah. like um, you know ch just churning out of great material. You know, and then the money goes back into producing more activism, and I just think that's so smart. Yeah, it's just making things that people can use in their own activism, like wearing yeah. a t-shirt that says child free on it. People will see that. Yeah, exactly. And, and masks. Um, that's what I was really thinking when I when I started that t-shirt company. And, and as part of it was Diane's idea also was just to make something people could wear out in the world or a book that you can give someone. Yeah. Just spread awareness. Or, you know, Diane makes stickers that people can put on their car. I think that's a great idea too. Yeah, those are great. I've, I've seen some of those that she's done. Um, so let's get into the real stuff in a section I'm calling art activism in YouTube. So um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you, your feelings on the importance of art in antinatalist activism? I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, more and more and more people are expressing themselves creatively through antinatalism and realizing oh, yeah. how untapped this thing is creatively. Yes, it is. It really is. And it's really inspiring to me as an artist, for sure. Um, I mean, I abandoned probably more ideas for the coloring book than I actually put into it because it just did generate so many. Um, yeah, I think art's incredibly important. And, and filmmaking, you know, filmmaking, people love film. They love movies. They love popular music like uh, Mistro. I just, that yeah. album he made is just incredible. And I listen to it all the time. It's so well made. Um, so if some, something sounds good and it looks good, people are going to look at it. And yeah. I, yeah, I think it's hugely important. 
I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Matt, you began your YouTube channel on February 17th, 2016, and your first video was an entry into my annual contest, the Why Are You an Antinatalist contest, the 2017 edition. Uh, it was the third year of the contest, and you have made a video for the contest every year since. Uh, I'm delighted to say, so thank you so much for that. Uh, and you won the established AN category last year. Congratulations again. But going back to 2017, uh, I, I guess you had been uh, lurking in the community for yeah. quite some time before that. I didn't actually realize that until this interview, that you, you've really been around you know, in the background for quite some time. What was it that made you make that decision to make that, make that video for the contest and make your first video and enter, enter the fray? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'd say the first thing was probably the TV show you did with Inmendum and Glenno. It's called Vlogger Dome. Okay argue the argument and uh I, I was just really inspired by it. and you guys called for submissions and you know like Glenn was a little animation in the middle of most of the episodes and I think Vox Deruta a couple other people contributed and I really wanted to do something but I, I was just working so many hours I couldn't uh couldn't get anything together so I, I was kind of disappointed in myself for that I'm like well if another opportunity comes up I'll, I'll definitely do that or contact you or something and then I found out about your contest and I'm like, I just have to do this. Like, this is the thing. It really was the kick in the pants I needed to to make a video. And I just remember, like, I think it was the day I, you extended the deadline. Luckily, I know you, you do that every year. I think that's a good thing because it. Yeah. I think I got in right on the day before the second deadline was over, and I, I just remember editing late that night trying to to get it together. And uh, yeah, so I have you to thank really for oh. my YouTube channel. <laughs> No, no, not at all. But I mean, I, I seem to remember that actually. Yeah, like it was yours was the last one in, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Wow, who is this?" You know, because it was just it just really blew me away, and they've they've continued to ever since then. So, and thank you for watching Vlogger Dome. Very few people have, so that's that's lovely. Well, I rewatch it all the time. Do you really? Wow. Yeah, they, well, it. thank you for that. Yeah, but it's, uh, you know, I, I'm very proud of that that show, even though you know it's it does it definitely has its issues. Um, the 2021 edition of the Why Are You an Antinatalist uh, contest will premiere July 3rd uh, of this year. So as somebody who has been involved every year, what can you uh, say to those out there that might be thinking about making their first antinatalist video? Any advice for mm. those people? Yeah, first thing I would say is just do it. <laughs> like, just do it. Like, I, I was just cutting stuff together and, uh, you know, I didn't even have a process down about how I was going to do my voiceovers and stuff, but I just, you know, that, that video was one of my shorter ones. And, yeah. And, you know, just, just do it. And uh, my recommendation also to people to prevent them from deleting their videos later on, yes. this, is a, this is a little pro tip for you. Don't watch them. Like, put it out there. Like, watch it. Like, when I put out a video, I watch it like four or five times to see what I did right or wrong or whatever. And then I kind of forget about it because I don't want to go back and like cringe at something I said like oh god i'm so embarrassed i need to get this off youtube like i don't i don't get that urge because i just don't watch them. <laughs> i mean I, you know i'm not, not saying you shouldn't watch your videos. some people might like their own old videos but I, I think that some people go back and they look at them and be like oh my god i gotta delete my whole channel because i don't believe that anymore or maybe i misspoke i mean i've said some wrong things and, and you know i try to correct them in the description box so i'm never wrong about something but i think it is important i know you agree as an archivist that we should really leave them up there. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, I, I would, I think it's great advice, first of all. And yeah, it's true. Unfortunately, I, I would say ballpark about 80% of the videos that are submitted for the contest every year don't survive yeah. the next year. So yeah, um, think about, you know, what you're doing before you submit and uh, yeah, maybe just don't, don't look at it for a while. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to say one more thing, like yeah. how you, you also, I know, have said, that you lurked for like a year or yes. so or more. Mm -hmm. And I did the same thing. Like after I discovered Amendum, I realized I had to really understand Ephelism and Benetarian and Anatolism. Uh So I just watched a lot of Amendum. And not only that, I took notes, rewatched them and uh, made sure that I knew what I was talking about. I think that is important too. And that'll help prevent people from deleting as well. I absolutely, a hundred percent. I think some people behave almost as if there's like a gun to their head to make the antinatalist video before they're ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's just very self-destructive, I, I, I think. And uh, yeah, so absolutely. I think, I think taking the time one needs 
before they make that leap is some of the best advice yeah. you can give them. And I think I might have even felt like I didn't deserve to have an antenatalist channel until I was sterilized because <laughs> I just I just really wanted to go all in on it. I can understand that. I, I don't think that, that I'm not saying that's advice to anyone, but I'm just saying for me, yeah. like I just wanted to. I just want, you know, I really wanted to be serious about it. And I thought yeah. if I was sterilized, people would take me more seriously. That's, that's, for, that, that's interesting. Yeah. No, that's, people got to do what they got to do in, in order to feel ready. And I think that, that that's very wise of you. Um, so much can be said about each of the entries that you made. I love them all. Uh, you know, for time, I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I did want to point out the absolutely beautiful 2019 entry called Designated Survivor. Um, can you tell me anything about this piece? It's, it's, it's really doesn't have any voiceover. There is a making yeah. of, um, but it's more of a short film. Right. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a short film. I want, I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could do a, why am I an antenatalist video without any voiceover? Um, but I did cheat a little bit because I found a song that called designated survivor, which just worked perfectly. I couldn't have had a better song and uh, it just made it so easy to cut together and, that was probably more work than most of the videos I did for the contest because I had to drive all over town and and find things that showed you that life isn't worth starting, you know, like the cancer ward and the adult foster care and trying to show what life ends up as without actually like going into the hospital. I was like, gee, should I wear like a, I even bought one of these um, lapel cameras, you know, like I, should I go in somewhere and show the cancer where I was like, no, I, I need to respect people's privacy. So I ended up just showing like the exterior buildings and things like that, that wouldn't be a privacy problem. I, I mean, it, I, it's an extremely powerful video without getting gratuitous at all. So I think those were wise, wise decisions. Um, I, I, I highly recommend people check that video out. Um, the, your winning 2020 entry was also fantastic. Is there anything you can tell us about um, that video called Letter to a Natalist Nation? Yeah, so that one, I actually, started out I wanted to write a TED talk like there I don't, to my knowledge there's never been an anti-natalist TED talk not yet and so I really wanted to do that um in front of a green screen I wanted to like have this on you know dressed up nice and pretend I was talking to an audience so it would have been a more uh cool video I think but you know it's one of those things also like when I tell people who are making a video like yes you might have these ambitions but don't let your ambition stop you from finishing you know, like just you know, it's great to have big ambitions because then you can just scale them back, you know, and make them more realistic. So I had this huge ambition, but that would have required me to practice um, rehearsing, you know, over and over again, if I was going to yeah. do myself pretending I was on stage and I would have had to make a CG stage and all this stuff. I'm like, well, I'll just make it one of my kind of standard videos, but I'll use the text that I was going to say for the TED talk. And that's kind of how that started. I uh, see. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, the Let's Draw series is a is really wonderful. It's an ongoing series on your channel, mm -hmm. which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, a lot of really wonderful art has come out of that series. The first two, uh, if I'm not mistaken, were commissioned pieces that were sort of variations on the same theme of of an infant being you know literally shot out of its mother. I think, right. it, um, and and forced to perform some you know insane feat. Right. Uh, um, can you tell me a little bit about both of these images and was, was the first one in fact used on an album cover? Supposedly, I, and the, this is a band in England that found me on DeviantArt, I think. And I did some other illustrations besides those two, but those two I thought would be good for Antonella's videos just because of the subject matter. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to know where they use them, but I, I just kind of lost contact with those guys. And, you know, whenever I, I do a piece, and this is kind of standard, um, even though they bought the artwork, I still own the copyright on them, so I can use them however I want. Okay, that's good. And they just made perfect. And it's just perfect that that, that lined up. So I was like, hmm, what am I going to do for my second video? And uh, I ended up talking to this band and about these images. And uh, yeah, they ended up making two good Kind of, and it helped me kind of find my voice as a video maker too, and like what my channel was going to be, and and also let me like, are people going to be receptive to watching a drawing video that's also an anti natalist video? Yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody had ever done that really before. I mean, Gary, to some extent, maybe mm -hmm. maybe I did yeah. that a little bit, but nothing like what you produced. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, and those videos have a lot of views on them. 
if I'm not mistaken. So I think it went over pretty well. Um, <laughs> um, it should be pointed out that you had a contest of your own at one point, which was a best comment contest, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what can you tell me about this contest? And do you think you'll you plan on having something like that again in the future? Yeah, I definitely plan on doing another comment contest someday. But uh, I was just trying to engage people more. In, in my channel and uh, wanted them to make more comments. So uh, one way to get people to make more comments is to offer some kind of prize. And uh, it, the toughest thing was deciding which one because I, I know there's quite a few good ones. Um, and it was fun because they also would determine what my next video would be, which would be the drawing that they picked. You know, They could uh, decide what Antonatus and, and the winner chose. Um, and Mendham punching them in the face, <laughs> which was very, very unique. I thought he might come up with something unique. Maybe that played a part in me picking him. But um, yeah, it ended up being a, a fun, interactive way to interact with the viewers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the image that came out of that one, too. I, 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 I would, I would kind of love to see you uh, sell that one as a print at some point, maybe on your Etsy. I, it, be great great hung on a wall um there's so many images produced from this series that I'd, I'd love to talk about again just for the sake of time uh, i just wanted to point to you know one of them which was this magnificent cover that you did for antinatalism magazine number three uh one of my personal favorite uh pieces of antinatalist art of all time uh, just an absolutely beautiful um homage to the sadly departed uh our, our sadly departed young friend uh Jouin. Um, Jun Hong. I always kind of forget how to pronounce his name properly. Um, how did this particular image come about? Well, Andreas Moss, who took over editing the magazine um, for Ji Woon, um, was working on issue three because he had already done issue two. And I probably saw my drawing videos on my channel and asked if I would be willing to, to do the cover. And I said yes. And I just wanted it to be good. Um, so I talked to talked a little bit about this in the making of video, but uh, I was kind of inspired by um, comic book covers that show, you know, one of the main characters, something kind of ghosted uh, in the sky, looking down upon a scene. Like there's a famous Batman cover of, of him looking over this castle and this woman running away. Um, and then I also wanted to incorporate the story, uh, the ones who walk away from Omelas, which is, yeah. has some negative utilitarian um, themes. Um, and then I was like, well, maybe if there's a way I can fit another antinatalist in it. And so I kind of wanted to pay tribute to derived energy also. And so I put him in there as the, the one who walks away. Yeah, I, I love that you included uh, Kirk in there. Um, did, did you know Kirk at all before he died? Did you ever no, I, with him? unfortunately, I was too late to, to get to know him. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, did, I did communicate with Ji Woon, though. So I, I got, yeah. got to talk to him a little bit. It was cool. He was very receptive to people emailing him. Yeah, I, I miss them both so much. Um, is there some sort of insinuation that Jawoon was like the child being sacrificed to Omalas? Kind, kind of. Oh yeah, you, I think you could read that into it. Yeah. 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 yeah it's 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 just an incredible image. Um, I, I I I I'm really I'm so glad that you you know you offered it as a as a thing that people can purchase on the Etsy. Um, out of curiosity, I mean, you, you, you know, you spoke a little bit about Brian Tomasic uh, earlier in, in this interview, um, but you do, you do comment uh, on his work uh, in that video about that piece uh, specifically. Just out of curiosity, did he ever comment or respond in any way? Or? No, he, no, he never has. Um, I thought maybe since we're both negative utilitarians, and since I did comment on him, you know, maybe he would, yeah. he would want to respond, but uh, ended up, David Pierce ended up making a comment, though, who's also- Really? Uh, prominent um transhumanist yeah so i guess maybe since david pierce commented he didn't um you know brian uh, didn't feel like he had to maybe yeah because yeah, brian but, was also a, a youtuber for a while there so. okay yeah I, I like some of his videos like i was watching one the other day with we were talking to uh, magnus bending it's a pretty good video mm. i mean it's just like we're so so close philosophically yeah but close to it so far yes yeah, exactly <clears throat> You've had a long ongoing conversation through videos with uh, vegan activist Ask Yourself. Can you summarize your conversation with him and maybe tell us about um, where things stand between you and him currently? Well, yeah, it's turned on to him probably from the Vegan Gains channel. And uh, he seemed to be 
more educated about philosophy and argument than maybe Vegan Gaines was. Like, um, Vegan Gaines never talks about his normative ethical view, really. Um, but then I was just prompted to respond to him because he made a video called Meta Ethics. And I was just really disturbed to find out that he was kind of nihilistic, uh, subjectivist. And I'm like, how can you be making rational arguments when you, you, your belief system is irrational? So I just made a response to him. And I think I might have responded to other people in that same video. <clears throat> and I don't think he responded to it. But then I made another one explicitly about him. And he did respond in a text comment. Um, but he never really made it a response video to me. But then maybe a year later, he did res do a video response to that video, um, which I thank him for because it exposed his, his audience to antinatalism. And I learned, yes, for sure, his view is irrational. And I just had to expose why it is. You know, not something negative about him. I just had to show his view was wrong. And he, he kind of doubled down on it. And he's actually, he sent me two emails recently because I just kind of, but they're really rude. Like he said, oh, I'll try not to embarrass you if you you come on my Discord, you know, I'll try to make too much fun of you or make, not make you look bad, but <laughs> it wasn't very nice. So I don't know, I just... I just haven't emailed him back because I, I, I mean, we, I think we've reached the end of where we, you know, if he were going to have a discussion on his YouTube channel, I might be interested, but he only wanted to do it on his discord. And I, I'm not really that interested in doing a discord debate. And I, I really agree with him and them that response videos are really more constructive than, than doing, you know, live debates because you can just be really succinct. And I think I had everything I had to say about his, his, um, philosophy and I think you know he he's not gonna give up his nihilism you know I'm pretty sure can you um give some commentary on the is odd gap can I give some commentary on it yeah because you've mentioned that in a few of your videos and I think it was in uh, one of the videos with ask yourself so yeah I'm curious as your thoughts on that yeah nihilists love that argument and also surprisingly GE Moore had a similar argument called the naturalistic fallacy and uh, they're, you know, they just try to say that you, you can't have uh, you. There is no um, ethical uh, impetus or whatever from a fact of nature, which I just totally disagree with. You know, they they think that there is, you know, like suffering in the world. It doesn't have an ethical component to it. Like they think ethics is just something that you make up and. And my argument is no, that pain intrinsically means avoidance. It's it's built into it. And you can't have some view that pain is good. You know, it's it's just intrinsically bad. So I just feel like the is a gap problem or naturalistic fallacies are, are poor arguments. Um another thing you brought up is that you're a moral <laughs> objectivist, right? Yes. And what is your critique on moral subjectivism? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, like the idealism of the, you know, 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, philosophy had pretty much gotten rid of this idealism, this subjectivist idea that the only thing we can know is is what's in our mind or what our mind perceives. But we have so much data from all the other minds and all of the books people have written. You know, we, we know that we all live in the same reality. We know that pain really is real. We know that other beings are experiencing the same thing we are. Um, so I don't understand subjectivism at all. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. Um, you did this uh, truly wonderful video uh, where you have a live discussion on the subject of antinatalism at the University of Michigan. And I'm so grateful that you actually got video of this event. Um, and I think you did an incredible job. What was the general response to this video like? Um, and do you think you'd like to do something like this again? Well, I think the response was great. I think... Um... I think a lot of antinatalists probably would like to be able to go into a classroom and, and expose the students, although I have to give it up to the, um, you know, the moderator or the professor who introduced this topic to the class, allowing me to be there and uh, talk about it. Um, yeah, the response has been very positive. 
I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it was a great video. Um, I just think it, it deserves to be said how generous you, you know, you've been with your talents, uh, with the rest of the community over the years, uh, you know, often donating these incredible pieces of art for the use of, you know, Facebook groups that are, you know, unfortunately were rejected by the ones that commissioned it. I use it all the time, um, you know, and other activist uh, you know, projects, um, the, the, you know, the logo of this very podcast is the, is the work of life sucks. Um, and I want to thank you for that so much. I mean, we're so, you know, we're all so lucky to have benefited from that. Um, and I just, you know, a lot of your work I think is becoming absolutely iconic of antinatalism and ethelism in particular, like I said, the logo for this podcast, the iconic A for antinatalism inside the shattered Ouroboros. Um, it's everywhere now. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, people that hate the podcast <laughs> are using it, you know, as their avatars, like on Facebook and stuff. Um, have you have you seen evidence of that? You know, I'm not I'm not on Facebook, so I right. guess not. No, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for telling me, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's incredible. Um, you also donated the incredible logo for the Antinatalist Film Festival, which I'm absolutely in love with. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, and I also just wanted to ask you a little bit about your Etsy page, which I love. Again, you know that, you know, with that, I think you're you know combining your activism with a kind of like you know cottage industry around uh, what you're doing, which I, I just think is so exciting. So I mean, what has the response to the Etsy been? I mean, have people? You know, I I, I hope that you haven't had any pushback, you know, from that kind of, uh, doing that kind of thing. I would hope that people haven't done that. Um, but I'm, I just was curious about how the community has received that kind of, kind of thing. I'm grateful. It's been, been very positive. Yeah, it's I'm really glad because I'm kind of new at this. Like I was exposed to t-shirt printing when I was in high school. We had a, one of the only, I think, useful classes for people who actually wanted to get a career out of high school to teach them how to print, uh, offset printing, and then also screen printing. Um, so I kind of knew what would go into it. But then building a setup in my home took some time and trial and error. And, and you know, I have to thank Diane also, Diane Bandy, who helped me, uh, you know, design, design one of the first t-shirts. Yeah. Um, is her, she suggested to me, yes, that's the one that Diane and I made together. Yeah, it's a really beautiful design. She thought, yeah, she thought the Uberos would make a good symbol. And, you know, it definitely does. Um, but yeah, everything's been really positive. So, yeah. So I'm cool. glad for that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the t-shirt designs are just across the board have been uh, really wonderful. The designs, the quality, the fabric even. Um, I wear this one all the time, I have to say. Um, and this, this image was recently kind of pilfered, right, by somebody else did a, did a similar thing yeah, with this? Yeah, so I made sure that no one had, had done that design before. Yeah. Um, the people listening on the radio, it's the words child-free done as the, the Coca -Cola, classic Coca-Cola logo. And yeah, I searched all the internet to make sure because I didn't want to copy anyone. And I found no one had done this before. So I, you know, I, I didn't use uh, necessarily a font. Like I, I kind of created this in Photoshop. And uh, yeah, it's something I would like to wear. So I thought other people might, might like to wear it. Yeah. And then, yeah, maybe six months after I'd made it or something, someone just copied it, just used a Coca-Cola font. And, and they, they're a drop shipping company. So I wanted to avoid doing drop shipping. I wanted to actually print them myself because... Yeah, the t-shirt quality is really important to me. Like this is one I made, and I just wanted—I knew that I like really soft shirts with a little bit of stretch. So I bought a ton of different shirts from the wholesaler to try before I even started printing shirts. But drop shippers—they use the cheapest um, yeah. shirts usually because it's all about making money. And of course, the people who do a drop shipping Etsy page—they don't make as much because this other company prints it and they just sell it, so they lose a big percentage. So that's why they use cheaper materials. And they use a process like called car uh, garment on demand, I believe. And it's really, it's just a printer, like an inkjet printer that prints on garments. So it doesn't have quite the nice screen printing quality. And that's something I, I wanted was quality. And it smells a lot of time. There's like that vinegar uh, yes, effect yes, in that kind right. of printing. Yeah. Yeah, no, everything is hand printed, you know, for those that, that, aren't, that don't know, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, highly go, you know, and also the masks. Very, very, very topical, very timely. Um, but also, this is another example of somebody, you know, using the uh, the Ouroboros yeah, symbol. Cool. Ash, Ash Hunter made these. Um, so very, very cool. Thanks, Ash. Uh, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your other YouTube channels, like your fitness channel? Sure, yeah. My next video is actually going to be on my fitness channel because it's been like a year since I made one. But it's kind of funny. So I made a response to an antinatalist YouTuber. 
he made a video called he's he's a devotee of during rider he made a video called bodybuilding sucks um which has since been deleted but let me realize there's a kind of a misunderstanding in the vegan fitness community about why you should lift weights and during rider of course promotes this idea that riding a bicycle is the best exercise so i had to make a response to that and it ended up becoming like a documentary <laughs> like i i ended up finding a lot of um footage that's you know, just public domain footage I could use in my video and uh, I didn't get much of a response from the vegan or anti community to this video which I understand I mean it's kind of outside the norm of philosophy and it's a philosophy of exercise it's not ethics based so I kind of reworked that video to be less of a response and uh, made it more just a general fitness and made a channel around it and now, I mean, that video got, geez, I don't know how many views it has now, but it's, it's so many more than, uh, than I got on my antinatism channel. Um, and I get way more emails and, and comments and stuff on my fitness channel. I already have more subscribers than I do on my antinatism channel. I only have like five videos. But if, I mean, that's understandable, you know, fitness is just a bigger subject that people research on YouTube. Um, but I'm sure I've exposed people to veganism because I mentioned I am a vegan in my videos. And I've gotten a lot of pushback on that. Some people just hate vegan. People call me skinny and, you know, people are very rude on my fitness channel. I knew that was going to happen though. Like I, I show my body, which was, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to do that or not, but um, some other fitness people who are my age have, do the same. So I was kind of inspired by them. Um, but yeah, my next video will be on that channel because I haven't done one in a long time. Um, now I'll get back to the um, Life Sucks channel. So it's just the two that you have, eh? Oh, uh, I have more, but they're, you know, more personal. Channel. I've been making videos for YouTube since YouTube came into existence. Um, oh, I have, wow. like I, and I started out just because I love editing. I just cut together, you know, things from old movies and set them to music. And so I made kind of music video type stuff that's out there. Do you get more negative comments on the fitness one than the antinatalist one? I think so. Yeah. The people who comment on the Antonia's channel are, have been really, really supportive. Um, luckily I do get some support on the fitness channel, but it's, it's almost overwhelmingly negative. Um, for one thing, it, I, I talk about a very controversial type of exercise. You know, like I've, I've made comments to vegan gains on a lot of his channels, hoping he'll kick, he can might respond. Cause he does the, I feel like he works out improperly and most people lift weights improperly. Um, so yeah, these, I don't know, for some reason, people just get very emotional about their type of fitness and the type of fitness people do now, it's popular, it's called high volume exercise. Um, so vegan gains, will, it'll work out like six days a week. And in my opinion, that's drastically over exercising and you're just kind of being counterproductive. So the way I explain exercise, it's called high intensity exercise. And uh, you only need to work out once or twice a week, but you have to do it intensely. That's that's the problem where people um, have a problem is that you have to, you, it's basically, it's painful. It's not really like Arthur Jones, the guy who uh, founded high intensity exercise um, said famously, um, you know, if, if you think exercise is fun, you're probably doing it wrong. So it's, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it, but it really is, you know, it's just one of those things like, I know it's not as important as ethics, but just kind of like how Menem has his physics channel because modern physics is so wrong, he feels like he has to say something. And I feel that way about exercise too. There's just so much fitness on YouTube that's um, wrong. And so many of them are liars. You know, all these fitness channels are all on steroids, but won't admit it to their audience. It's just disgusting. I just hate liars and misinformation. So I just had to, and you know, I'm, I do these workouts anyway, so I might as well just tape myself and, and put some commentary out there. Yeah, I just found it fascinating that I would suspect it would have been the antinatalist stuff that got more negative negativity, but actually, the, <laughs> the I fitness. know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess lot, people lot, are more people are more used to being negative about fitness than they are about procreation. Yeah, they they probably Maybe. go around trolling and yeah, like they they make really personal attacks on me. I'm, I'm sorry to hear but, that. Yeah, I, know, I just try to have a thick skin and and you know if they make multiple comments, I just ban them. 
Um, so now we have finally come to the part of the interview where I would love to discuss uh, really your masterpiece, the ABCs of antinatalism, the ethics of procreation from A to Z, your coloring book. Um, here it is in all of its glory, the full finished published and released work. Um, I've already gushed multiple times about it in videos and plan to in many more. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, when I say that you have outdone us all, Matt, I truly mean it. I think this is a game-changing piece of antinatalist activism, something that truly has the uh, power to appeal to such a tremendously wide spectrum of people, um, and that may in fact, you know, I, I think has every potential in the world to be a lot of people's first introduction to the subject. Um, how did you originally get the idea to do this project? I just knew, I just felt a little bit limited by YouTube and you know like how, how could I ever come close to making a video as good as in Mendham you know I, like his his language is just so uh just perfect I mean he just explains things so well like how could I all I could do is just elaborate on him um but I do I do try to add something to my videos you know adding music and photography and things to make them more fun to watch um but I thought I could do more than than that um, so I thought of making films or a uh, book. And for me, I'm an illustrator. So instead of, and also how could I compare with Benatar, you know, writing a book about antinatalism. Um, an illustrated book is something that hadn't really been done. And it's something that was in my skill set. So that's kind of where it came from. I just wanted to do something else. How long did it take you to complete? Oh, probably a year. I knew it was, I knew it was probably going to take a year. Um, so I spent a couple months just writing because I, I was working full time at the time. At the time, it was really hard to find the time to do it. So I just had to really discipline myself. So I'd work my you know nine to five job, and then um, you know spend time with my wife and my dogs, and then in the evening come up here around ten and work till about midnight or so. Um, I try to do that almost every day during the week. Then on weekends, have a few hours to draw because uh, I do a, a process called iterative drawing where. I draw everything kind of small at first and just work out my composition and then I blow it up and draw it again. And then I sometimes blow it up again and redraw it and then again, it takes some time to do. And then really the formatting and everything took a lot longer than I thought that was going to take. Like I wish I had someone to just do that for me, but uh, since I had to do it all myself, yeah, it took about a year. Uh, what do you think was the most difficult image to produce of the whole book? Oh, you know, this may seem strange but um this one called why is for youth yeah. it's just a, an old woman um looking at a picture of herself and i actually had a lot, i actually redrew this one four or five times <clears throat> oh wow because, yeah because it, it was kind of a strange composition um i originally was going to have her like looking at a mirror of herself and seeing the young image in the mirror but then of course perspective wise you're only going to see the back of her head so how, and I wanted to see tears coming from her eyes because I wanted to show the the sorrow you know of looking at an old picture of yourself and I just could not get that composition to work where I could see her face and the face of the image so I thought maybe she could be holding a picture and she's just very subtly pointing it towards the viewer so you can see both easily and and uh yeah for some reason I just had a hard time with that one from a composition point and I was like god I was getting so much better at drawing because I was doing it every day that I thought the last few images would just go really fast because I just was more practiced, but that one was just, I just got hung up on it. Did you, did you do them in order of the alphabet? I like did them did, in order, yeah. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, why for youth is a, it, it's an, it, it, it's an incredible image and it's in some ways for me, it's like, it's, it's maybe one of the most like emotionally devastating yeah i showed it to my wife and she was like oh my god i i, yeah. like, I don't even want to see that <laughs> yeah it just it's it, it's just so many personal stories things that reminds me of it's yeah it's an incredible image um how much research do you think had to go into every every image i, I imagine quite a lot yeah i guess that's one thing that took time too is um i did have to do research before well, and during the writing process so I had Benatar, I had the Antinatalism magazine, I had the Antinatalism Wikipedia page, the Ethelism wiki, um, you know, Vlogger Dome I went through. Um, anything that kind of had a summary kind of aspect of Antinatalism covered the big subjects. Um, yeah, so there, there was a lot of research that went into the book. 
Yeah, it shows. I mean, you spoke a little bit about the research that went into this image for value, which is absolutely one of my favorite of the whole book. Um, just such a brilliant, you know, visual depiction of sentient value with the brains and yeah. Yeah. For that one, I had to research what um, a little doggy's brain looks like. So that was kind of stressful for me <laughs> and a horse brain and a chicken brain. <laughs> so I had to look at actual gross or, for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you put, you put yourself through all kinds of hell to produce this thing. So, uh, you know, um, do you have any particularly favorite image, you know, from the book? Um, I do kind of like the cover page. Um, cause I'm always trying yeah. to practice drawing women. Um, but probably E is for Ephelism. That might be my favorite. Cause that's one I'd been wanting to draw for a long time before I even thought of doing this book. I thought, how could I make like a, a poster or something that represents Ephelism? Yeah, the one for Ephelism is is incredible. I did want to ask, actually, although I forgot to write a question about about this. Is this the button in the middle? Oh, you could interpret it that way, but it's mostly supposed to just be an atom. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, so much to my absolute surprise and delight, the letter J uh, was for my character, the janitor from my movie, The Ephelis, and it was prom prominently featured in the ABCs of antinatalism. I really cannot thank you enough, Matt, and not only that you actually sent me the original drawing um, for Jay. And uh, this is without question one of like my most prized possessions now. I thought the frame was going to come today. <laughs> it didn't. So it's just, you know, it's just, this is just how it came, uh, you know, uh, when you sent it in the mail. So thank you so much for that. I just wanted to show uh, You're that so off welcome. briefly. It's so beautiful. Um, and I'm, I'm just so honored. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, aside from, you know, buying the coloring book, how can people help you get this into as many people's hands as possible? Um, do you think that we should like, should we figure out some kind of strategy, some kind of way that we can like, you know, purchase a bunch of copies and donate it to a bunch of people in places? Uh, is there, is, I mean, do people put coloring books in libraries or special book collections? I mean, that might be an interesting uh, thing to try to do. How can we yeah. spread it far and wide? It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I'm going to send it to some of my philosophy professors uh, locally and, and some that I've heard of um, who live elsewhere. And I think maybe that'll help them introduce it to their classes, perhaps. Might be an idea. Um, I know some yeah. people have talked about like buying some copies and just leaving them in places where someone might discover them. Yeah, I'm planning on doing some of that myself for sure. Um, I have to tell you that when I posted about the coloring book on social media, you know, I put it all over all the Reddit groups that I am not banned oh, from you. and all the Facebook groups that I'm not banned from. And, uh, you know, I just put it as many places as possible. And um, the attention that it got in all of these groups even some of the really small ones that like you know nobody ever thumbs anything up or you know posts anything right. um, it got more attention than just about anything antinatal news related that I've seen you know oh, get wow. in years and years and years so I really want you to know I mean just from that bit of information that I mean I think you really did hit you know strike a nerve um, with people and uh, oh, yeah great. just huge congratulations for that oh, wow. uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what are, what's some of the feedback that you've been receiving so far? Yeah, you know, I haven't gotten too much. I had a lot of really nice comments on the video I did, you know, inter introducing it. Um, and of course, gotten great feedback from you. And, and of course, getting that positive feedback from Amendum. I mean, I just couldn't believe that. I just was so honored that he talked about the book and, and showed some of the pages. I, mean, I couldn't ask for more. Yeah, you blew him away for sure. Um, have people been sending you in like their colored versions yet? One person did. Yeah. That's Sweet. it so far, but it was, it was cool to see. I'm, I'm for sure going to do some of that in the, in the near future. I gotta, I gotta find my crayons, <laughs> but once I do that, I'll, I'll definitely be doing some of that. Could you tell us anything about the video series you have planned to make along with the book? Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it cause I don't want to like make my expectations too high, but I mean, I would love to make a video on every page because when I was thinking of, when I was working on these, just drawing and drawing, I was thinking about what I should talk about in a video. And uh, I already, you know, colored in the cover, obviously. So I recorded myself coloring that in. So that'll be a video coming out soon. A is for antinatalism. And uh, yeah, I think it'd be, you know, working on these drawings for so long, I would really like to color them in myself. You know, I think it'd be fun. So yeah, I'd love to do a series, coloring series. Uh, I thought about coloring it, let's, or calling it Let's Color or something, but maybe I'll just, it'll just be the ABC series and 
And uh, yeah, I can really talk about these images and, and color them in and maybe that'll encourage other people to color them too. Sounds good. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I just wanted to say, Matt, that, you know, I initially was like, should I ask him about each image? But I, I still don't want to, like, spoil the book for people. Right. So, you know, I want to encourage people to go out and buy the book. I don't want to just, like, make the R2 known, uh, you know, within, within this context. Um, but is there anything else, you know, before we move on that you wanted to say about the coloring book that we maybe haven't talked about yet? And how can people go buy it? That's another thing we should do. Yeah, you can, you can get a digital copy on lulu.com. You can get the print copy on Amazon, or if you just want me to sign it, you can get that on my Etsy and I'll send, send you some crayons with it too. That sounds great. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, what do your friends, family, and coworkers think about your belief with antinatalism, ethylism, and veganism? Well, they know all my friends and, and family know I'm a vegan, but they don't n really necessarily know I'm deep into this antinatalism philosophy, but they know that I'm anti-having kids. I think a lot of them probably think it's just because for financial reasons or just that it just is a hobby I'm not interested in. So I don't really get too much into it because I think all of my friends have children, all of my, all of my old friends. So I, I tend not to talk about it too much. You know, like, you know, like I was just up, up north with my extended family on my dad's side and, you know, one of my cousins has just had a child, her second child. And what am I going to say? Something negative in front of all my family now. I mean, that's just not really the, the time and place for it. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't talk to anyone about antinatalism except online, pretty much. Okay. But you can send them their first coloring book when they get uh, older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and that's the thing. Like, none of my friends even know I've, I've drawn this thing. Yeah. How, how does that feel? Like, you've, you've, you've contributed something of great value, and you haven't, you know, shared that with your friends. Is, is there a little bit of a <clears throat> loss there? Oh, yeah. Like, like, my wife was like, oh, it's so sad I can't show this to my mom because they you know they like my artwork and encourage me in my art and stuff and but they just wouldn't be very receptive to it and it's probably just not a good idea <laughs> I don't want them to like feel bad that they brought my wife into existence or something so. but you have a lot of support from your uh, your partner oh yeah yeah that means her support means everything to me that's great yeah what are some of your other hobbies well obviously I love I'm interested in exercise uh, photography. Um, I, I'm into hydroponics. I like, uh, you know, growing plants. Um, my house is kind of a hobby slash job because uh, I'm just trying to work on my house and improve the house. Like this was a, we really put a lot of time and money into this place, um, fixing it up and making it modern. Um, yeah, drawing, obviously. Um, reading philosophy. I also love um, you know, reading comic books. I read probably read one or two comic books a day. Um, novels, history. I'm just, I just love reading. Do you have any book recommendations for philosophy books? Oh gosh, besides the ones I've already talked about. Um, well, I'd say you know Magnus of Ending's book's pretty good. Suffering Focus Ethics. No, well, I'm I'm not even all the way through it, but um, well, I really I really like Ji Woon Wang's book, even though like it's you know it's in broken English. I like that one. What would be your like top five books of like philosophy? Oh, like Sch Schopenhauer's essays and aphorisms. Um, Benatar, of course, is probably number one. Um, I love Sarah Perry's Every Cradle is a Grave. Um, but there's it's sometimes hard to recommend philosophy books because, you know, like I like G.E. Moore, but then he had that crazy naturalistic fallacy that I don't agree with. So, but I don't know, there's, there's at least three or four for, there for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always looking to expand my library. Um, if I read something, I'll let you know. Thank you. I did want to say Magnus Winding does have a book on, on what he at the time was calling wild animal antinatalism that hmm. I, think, I think didn't get enough attention. I would definitely recommend it. It's really oh, okay. short. It's not in print, but it's, you can get it on, on uh, Kindle. Okay. Um, what do you think of the antinatalist community as it exists today? Well, I've seen it grow even since I've been involved in it. So I really like seeing that. And um, yeah, I mean, just, I'm really proud of everyone who's made videos and continues to make, make response videos. And of course, you know, they mend them as graces us with a new video once a week. I appreciate him for doing that, even though he's, he has under other interests now. He feels like, like he said everything, but he still makes really quality content once a week. I look forward to that every Sunday. Um, 
yeah, I'm just really, I really like seeing it grow. I mean, I know it's had setbacks, but yeah, I think it's, it's not in a terrible place. There's really quite a bit of, I mean, especially your podcast is just that both of you guys have made is, has really improved. Just that, it was like a step, raised the community up a step, I think. Oh, I appreciate that, Matt. I don't know how many people <laughs> agree, but I, I really do appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I mean, there's been pushback, right, with the podcast. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that in communities, um, groups. No, not really. Okay. That's, well, we've seen it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure. But I mean, I just love how everywhere it is. Like, uh, I was just dry. I had a four hour drive this weekend and uh, I just went on my Amazon Music and there it was. And I could just stream it right from there. So I like that you put it on all these different platforms. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. What are certain aspects of the podcast that you enjoy and some that you would, would want to, I don't know, um, upgraded well i mean the format's great you know hour hour and a half with all these different people and, and you've you've exposed me to people i've never even heard of and uh i just i love that like someone i haven't discovered i can kind of dive into <clears throat> um i mean it makes you think i think that's really one of the best things about it and it's a, it's a it's a record it's a permanent record of, of these voices and uh, i think that's maybe the most important thing that people can come back and, and reference this in the future yeah. What do you think antinatalists are doing right so far? And what do you think we're doing wrong? Um, like making content is good. Um, trolls are never really appreciated. I don't think they really help anything. Um, don't delete content. <laughs> I think that's not a good thing. What do you think the future of antinatalism looks like? I, w I mean, I would like to see it more like the vegan movement and, and, uh, see more activism personally i mean it's yeah it's nice to make some comments in a in an echo chamber on new or on reddit or something but it's even better to go out in the world and create awareness because yeah, there's, un there's unborn people that are going to suffer and i think you should make people aware of that a hundred percent i didn't mean to interrupt you sorry about that oh, go ahead. what are the types of antinatalist activism that you'd like to see more of well art of course i'd like to see more antinatalist films especially um, music, um, books, um, even making, um, you know, I've just making this book, I've been exposed to more artists who I didn't even know existed who said, hey, I also make antinatalist art and here's my Instagram. Uh, I just, I love that. I love seeing that stuff on, on Instagram because that's such a popular website. Yeah, it does seem like antinatalist art, that's been a great place for it is Instagram for sure. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that antinatalism, you know, will continue to be an important part of your work? I mean, I know that's kind of an obvious question, but. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I might get pulled away to do, like I have this animal rights books I would like to do, like children's books or something like that. Um, but even though uh, I might get pulled away in that direction, I think I would always like to come back to antinatalism and be a part of this community. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Um, I know you just finished this tremendous, you know, tour de force work. Uh, and you have a lot on your plate at the moment, for sure. But um, what do you think will be next for you? Are you working on anything currently? Um, probably the videos for the book will probably, and coloring them in will probably be my next thing. But uh, I actually have scripts for 50 videos or something. I mean, I, I have so many videos I would love to make. It's just a matter of time. Like I have some I've been sitting on for years that I just haven't finished. And there's just so many things in this antenatal world like you know like you said it's very inspiring and uh um it, it it's just uh, motivating to me too like it makes me want to create so that's why i think i'll keep coming back to it that's great well life sucks matt i just want to say um that you've had a very positive influence on my life and i really want you to know that um i had the shock of my life in one of your videos uh you mentioned that you'd had a discussion with me at one point and I was what finally turned you into a full blown extinctionist at, at Epilus, which I, I quite was quite honored to find out. Uh, and I have to say that it was you and Tejas that finally inspired me to go vegan. So I'm glad that we've, you know, have been able to be a good influence on each other. And I want to thank yes, you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Matt, the, the brilliance and talent, talent that you've given to this movement should be highly prized by every antinatalist of every variety. You are an inspiration, uh, and the entire antinatalist community is lucky to have you within our numbers. Uh, thank you for everything that you do, my friend, and thank you so much 
for being our guest today on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Well, thank you for everything you do, and you are an inspiration to me as well. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, Mark. Thank you. Subscribe to the Life Sucks YouTube channel, check out his blog on Tumblr, and you can buy masks, t-shirts, prints, and signed copies of the ABCs of Antinatalism coloring book, The Ethics of Procreation from A to Z, by Life Sucks on his Etsy. You can also buy the ABCs of Antinatalism coloring book on Amazon.com, and a digital version is also available on Lulu. Links to all of this and more in the description. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. This has been Amanda Old Fansukanik and Mark J. Maharaj. You can find us on the YouTube channels Forever Wolf Films and Question Mark, respectively. Keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on the YouTube channel Exploring Antinatalism Podcast as as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and so many other platforms. Our website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the amazing Visions Noir. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bionoir.com and find more of his links below. Logo art by the incredible Life Sucks. Please visit his YouTube channel, and if you would like to perhaps purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life Sucks, please visit his Etsy page at www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. And proudly announcing, our new theme music has been graciously provided by I Doubt It. I Doubt It is an alum of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, so please listen to his episode, episode four, and visit his amazing YouTube channel. All the best, and bye for now.